This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. In chapter one, we look at what's meant by the term assurance. And essentially it is that one person is giving some sort of assurance, some sort of comfort to another person that something is correct or that something is in fact so. Therefore, if I were buying a house, I want some sort of assurance that the house is safe, is not going to fall down. It would be normal for me to uh, hire a surveyor who would come and look at a house, examine its structure and give me a report to say that the house is safe. Or if there are any particular problems with the house to point out what those were. Why don't I do that myself? Well, in the case of a house, I wouldn't have the skill. I can go and look at a house, but I wouldn't be able to really tell whether it was in a you know, particularly safe or dangerous condition. Similarly, in the UK, uh, once your car is about three years old, you have to get an annual certificate uh, which states that the car is roadworthy. And to do that, you take it to a licensed garage, they do a certain number of tests, and they might recommend some repairs. But at the end of all of this, they should be able to issue a certificate saying that the car is roadworthy. And again, drivers don't have the skill necessarily to do that. And of course, drivers don't necessarily have the independence. Otherwise, they'd just be passing their own cars all the time. And it's similar in, in financial statements. Uh, why don't uh, shareholders look at the financial statements themselves? Well, probably not the skills. They probably don't have the time to do it, and it's certainly not very efficient for every shareholder to look at the financial statements kind of independently and kind of go checking through them. And also, they may not be in the right place. The business that they're invested in might be in the north of the country or indeed an entirely different country, and the idea that they will travel and do some uh, uh, checking up themselves is simply not economical. So, for the sake of time, skill and location, we hire somebody else to do it. We rely on someone else to do it. We have to think very carefully of how much checking should they do, what standard should they give the assurance to, because generally speaking, the more and more checking that takes place, first of all, the more expensive it gets, and secondly, the more time-consuming it becomes. So you're waiting longer and longer and longer before you get the assurance and can actually do something with the results. And that's not great. And in the case of audits, the standards of auditors are working to are the international uh, standards and auditing which are issued, which more or less say, here's how you should do the audit. And if you do the audit like this, then you're getting the amount of a work you're doing up to a reasonable standard, a reasonable standard. And then you issue a report. Uh, in the case of an audit, the report is issued to the shareholders, to the members. In the case of my car, well, the report is issued to me, but it's also issued to the government, uh, where it's held in the database and the, the, the police see my car being driven around without a valid uh, certificate, uh, then of course they can pull me over or I can, I, can I can be fined. And audit is only one form of assurance, but is by far the most important form of assurance in the syllabus. Okay, let's see uh, what the elements of an assurance engagement are. And there are five elements here. First of all, there's what's called a three-party relationship uh, between the practitioner, that would be the auditor, a responsible party, and in the terms of a an audit, that would be management, directors, because they're the people who are responsible for producing the financial statements. The auditors are responsible for auditing or checking those financial statements. And then there is the intended users, and the intended users would be the shareholders, the owners of the company. So directors produce the financial statements, uh, the auditors audit the financial statements, and then the financial statements and the audit report would be issued to the users of those. 
We need uh, appropriate subject matter. So we need to know what's meant by financial statements, what's actually covered by the audit report, and this has to be defined. Suitable criteria are the suitable criteria for financial statements. They should be prepared in, 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 in accordance with the international uh, accounting standards or the, or the, um, uh, the international financial reporting standards. Uh, and if they're not prepared according to those standards, uh, then they will kind of fail the test. They, they would uh, be objected to in some way by the auditors. The auditors must uh, collect sufficient appropriate evidence. Remember I mentioned evidence right at the start. You have to have sufficient appropriate evidence to support the uh, assurance which you're giving to the members. And then there will be a written assurance report quite often laid down in a specific form uh, so that people uh, have an idea of exactly what they're getting for the money, an idea of exactly what kind of uh, assurance are actually going to be receiving. Three-party relationship, we've kind of been through this already. An auditor, responsible person, that will be the directors who are responsible for, for drawing up the financial statements, and then the intended users, which in terms of financial statements, as I said, was members or shareholders. Appropriate subject matter, uh, by uh, far for, for you, the most uh, appropriate, the most common appropriate subject matter will be the financial statements. Uh, but auditors or other people giving assurance could be asked to give some sort of opinion on something else, like a budget, like a cash flow forecast. Increasingly, firms are getting um, fussy, anxious, if you like, to show themselves as being environmentally friendly. Uh, and increasingly, therefore, in the annual reports, they put in information about their recycling of waste, about their carbon footprint and so on. And sometimes they, they want to give a bit more strength to those reports by having somebody uh, basically validate those figures and to, to sign a report gi uh, giving some assurance that the information they are reporting is correct. The appropriate subject matter has to be uh, identifiable, it has to be well defined, and we will see uh, shortly what's meant by the financial statements and, and so on. And also it must be capable of being basically verified that, uh, that we can collect sufficient appropriate evidence. And we'll see that uh, very shortly there's a kind of slight difference in the sort of assurance you can give. Think uh, if you were asked to give an assurance on the profit and loss account from last year uh, and maybe the profit and loss account of next year, the budget. If you're looking at the profit and loss account of last year, you could go, you could examine invoices, uh, you could examine purchases, you could examine wages, you could look at the depreciation charge. There's lots and lots of evidence you can get about last year's profits. But what about next year's profits? A budget. And a budget is subject to all sorts of assumptions about the economy and what sales you're going to make and perhaps what um, a special offers your competitors are going to make and you have to respond to those and so on. The level of assurance you can give for some sorts of assignment are much lower uh, than for others. The criteria, as we say, were the benchmarks used to evaluate the subject matter. And it is for financial statements, it is the uh, international accounting standards or the international financial reporting standards uh, there. You may be asked to say that the uh, 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 financial statements also comply with local laws and so on there. Uh, and to understand things properly, there's no point really in saying these financial statements have been drawn up according to a certain criteria, a certain standard, if you haven't got access to what that standard is. So when my car is being examined to make sure it's roadworthy, there's a great checklist of everything that has to be uh, checked by the mechanic. Uh, it is carefully laid down uh, how good your brakes have to be, what the thickness of the tire tread has to be, and so on. So people get some feel that when the certificate is actually issued of, of what it actually represents, what the criteria are. Evidence. We need professional scepticism. 
we'll, we'll, again, we'll come to this later, but uh, professional scepticism means that you don't believe everything you're told, but at the same time, you don't disbelieve everything you, you're told. A skeptic is someone who doesn't know. Uh, and if you're told something, you want evidence to support that. It's not that you're assuming people have deliberately told you lies, but people can be optimistic, they can make errors, they can be in a hurry and give you a flippant answer and so on. And we need sufficient, appropriate evidence. Sufficient is really the quantity of evidence, and appropriateness is more the quality of evidence. Is this evidence actually supporting what's been said? Is it a useful thing which is going to be able to uh, uh, support our conclusion when we give our assurances? The assurance report uh, can be in two forms. You can have a positive form, also known as a reasonable assurance engagement. And this is basically where you're saying, this is so, this is correct, this is okay, or very positive. Uh, so here we could say, in our uh, opinion, the internal control is effective. So we've gone through the system which uh, a client has. We've looked at how they authorize invoices, authorize overtime, make sure payments are made only to the right people. And we can say, yes, they're pretty much doing it correct. It's called reasonable assurance engagement because no assurance engagement is ever really going to give you guarantees. If you think about it, if you're going to give people a 100% guarantee that something is correct, then you must look at everything. You must always re-perform everything the company did. And that is not normally practicable. What you look for is reasonable assurance uh, that there are no material errors. The other form of assurance is a negative form, or that's called a limited assurance engagement. And this is basically saying we've looked at stuff. Uh, we're not saying it's absolutely correct, but we're saying we have found nothing which means that it is wrong. And that's obviously a much lesser degree of assurance than the positive one. The negative form of assurance is what you would give if you're asked to talk about next year's budget. You say, I've looked at the budget, the assumptions look okay, I've checked through the calculations, there's no obvious errors there, and you would say, basically, based on our work, nothing has come to our attention uh, for us to believe that the budget is incorrect. But that is falling a long way short of saying that the budget is correct. Audits are positive assurance. We want to be able to say that the financial statements show a true and fair view. So here we have examples. The accounts show a true and fair view. The cash flow forecast is correct. Maybe the appointment of the employee was fair. And you need a lot of evidence to support that positive. Negative, we've discovered, discovered nothing wrong with the accounts. That wouldn't be appropriate for an audit. Uh, but some people who don't have to do audits like the uh, auditor to look at their uh, accounts anyway to give some sort of assurance and that the work will be a little bit less to give negative assurance, a little bit cheaper. The basis of the forecast is uh, not unreasonable, you'd say that. You wouldn't say the one at the top. It'd be very, very unlikely to find someone, basically, who would say this. You'd be really foolhardy if you're going to say the cash flow forecast is correct. But so much depends on assumptions. So much can go wrong. And this one here, we're not quite sure where this one would go. Could you give a positive assurance that appointing an employee was fair? Or, or are we more likely to, to go back to the kind of negative assurance uh, because we found nothing wrong with the, uh, uh, the appointment? Sometimes you can't give assurance. Sometimes you can't get appropriate and or sufficient evidence. Sometimes you get the evidence and you think, well, this is actually wrong. This doesn't support what's being said. So there are two reasons, really, why uh, a practitioner would not express what's called an unqualified conclusion. There's some doubt, in other words, about their conclusion. 
First is, there's a limitation on scope of the practitioner's work. In other words, they simply can't find the evidence. Maybe it's been destroyed inadvertently. Maybe somebody wiped the, 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 the computer disk. Maybe there's a fire in the office. You had no backups. Uh, and you've no way simply of getting the evidence that the financial statements are correct. Sometimes you look at the financial statements and you look at that figure and you look at the evidence and you say, that figure is wrong. Okay, so here we will be saying that the figure is materially misstated. We're not dealing with, you know, five dollars here, one dollar there. That's neither here nor there in a big company. But we're saying something is sufficiently wrong that I, I, I don't want to say that the financial statements show a true and fair view.